Okay, hello. <laughs> My name is uh, Maya. I'm a, a doctoral student uh, from Liepaj University. And my uh, research uh, topic is uh, slow media art and deep sustainability. I've been uh, working uh, in uh, this uh, field of uh, eco art or bio art or uh, making uh, installations using plants. So I struggled to uh, how to call my practice in a, in a word. So I started calling it uh, slow media art because I really like this uh, process-based uh, experience that uh, also comes from experience of the artist and experience of uh, the viewer. So uh, enjoying an artwork that is not, uh, uh, not an object, but experience. And uh, so I started calling it, well, when I researched the uh, sustainable art, I really, really didn't like the term. When you Google sustainable art, you get uh, sustainable fashion, uh, sustainable uh, sculptures, uh, sustainable sculptures made out of garbage. And uh, so the main problem with sustainable art is that we collect our garbage and we make a lamps, for example, as in a picture, or we make a sculpture. The first time around, we make our art, we exhibit it, we sell it, we are happy. Second time around, our, uh, our own garbage is gone. Uh, we take uh, maybe garbage from our uh, city. The third time, we... Uh, post on Facebook, does anyone has garbage? I need some garbage. Fourth time, we have to produce garbage to make our sustainable art artwork. And that is my main problem with uh, this sustainable art, sustainable fashion, sustainable, uh, let's clean up our beach and then produce some design objects. Because it's essentially not sustainable. It would be more sustainable to recycle those materials in proper way instead of uh, putting glue into them or welding them together because then they become true garbage and they can't be recycled anymore. So I started uh, using this uh, deep sustainability and uh, this is uh, the deep part comes from deep ecology. Uh, deep ecology is a, it's not really a theory. I don't uh, want to kind of highlight it as uh, some kind of uh, great uh, uh, philosophy, but uh, it uh, comes from the 70s when a group of artists were, well, not artists, philosophers, writers, thinkers, hikers, and uh, they were uh, troubled by uh, uh, the loss of wildlife in America. When, uh, because uh, of, uh, that over, well, not, uh, not population, but more of uh, industrial development and agricultural development, uh, a lot of uh, wildlife was uh, separated into uh, parks that they would just uh, dedicate small spaces for wildlife, but uh, just uh, clearing out large areas for development. And uh, because uh, for the actual wildlife, you can't really tell them, okay, you used to live in this huge area. Now we have dedicated three spots for you. Are you okay, okay with that? No. And so people were very troubled by that. And they started uh, writing texts, self-publishing texts and poems, songs. And some of them were actual essays. And that's that's a kind of 70s, 80s, uh, and it's uh, they called it this deep sustainability. And uh, so these are uh, this is a self test from uh, from one of the deep sustainability essays, and uh, it's uh, it was uh, supposed to show how uh, to save the planet. We have to have a very holistic, very kind of connected approach uh, where humans are not above everything else. 
So if uh, the choice is uh, that uh, to to save some biodiversity, we have to reduce the amount of humans. We reduce the amount of humans. So choosing between biodiversity and human wealth, we choose the biodiversity. And it's, a, it's that kind of approach uh, to deep uh, ecology. Humans, not first. But uh, I wanted to... Uh, this is, there are more questions, I selected some. And uh, most uh, what, uh, I, what I wanted to ask you, maybe you don't have to say out loud, but uh, I would really like you to uh, point north. <laughs> and this uh, pointing north is such a, it's such an easy little thing that... Uh, uh, when uh, when I ask people just in, in, in situations like this to point north, it's just on a map. Yes, of course. In real life, not so much. And uh, how many neighbors do you have? So how many neighbors do you have? In, uh, in the place where you live? And the, how many of those neighbors, how many names of those people you know? Nobody. Really. <laughs> oh, maybe you want to try. How many neighbors do you know? What is a neighbor? <laughs> like if you live in an apartment building, then the people on your floor, maybe. And the nearest the houses. Ah, okay. Um, I assume around five. Next, next door. Do you know their names? No, no, no. And uh, so uh, uh, when we uh, talk about this uh, holistic approach to saving the planet, uh, with the problem that I see with it, because uh, we live online, a lot of our time we spend online, and we recognize people by their email addresses. And uh, we are so disconnected from uh, just our, our own environment, our neighbors, because they are not convenient to us. We probably know the, the name of the neighbor that uh, helps us around sometimes, the one that uh, has, uh, I don't know, some instruments or the, something that we need. Uh, but uh, we are so disconnected from just uh, the immediate environment that we are living in that is not convenient to us. And this is the, the, the problem that uh, deep ecology was trying to raise. And uh, not only about uh, birds and, and, and biodiversity and trees, but also that we are disconnected from each other. And this is 70s. So this is very long time ago. And, uh, we now hear the, about the same, same topics. We are still discussing the same things. Since then, absolutely nothing has changed. We are still as disconnected, only now it's, uh, uh, we, we talk about it a bit more and in a bit more scientific way, not just songs and poems. My favorite uh, deep uh, ecology uh, exercise uh, is by one of the co-founders of the of this movement uh, when uh, he was uh, hugging a rock for weeks <laughs> trying to think like a rock or uh, uh, sleeping in a desert not moving looking at birds trying to uh, see the world through the eyes of the birds so he could figure out how to how to help the birds uh, from the birds perspective and uh, these are some of the artworks that, I, that inspire me when I talk about sustainability in deep sustainability way. And uh, Agnes, uh, Dennis, from, uh, these are two artworks, uh, 10 years uh, between, in uh, 82 and 92. Uh, so planting a wheat field in, uh, in kind of area that was... Uh, and well, kind of left behind, there was an old port and a lot of uh, city garbage was dumped there. And uh, so she made a, a wheat field of 8,000 square meters. 
It's a huge area in Manhattan that is now repurposed into a normal living space. It has been normally cleaned up. But while it was still a landfill, she uh, planted uh, a wheat field. And uh, this is the second work in, uh, in 92. Is, uh, she planted a forest on a man-made mountain. 400 uh, people came to plant uh, 400 trees. And the idea is that they will be growing for 400 years. And uh, these are still, I don't see them as uh, deep sustainability artworks, but they inspired me and they inspired kind of uh, uh, the thinking of a more involved uh, way of uh, living. And uh, the second one that I wanted to show uh, is uh, uh, Robert uh, Hensgewel. Uh, I have never pronounced this out loud. <laughs> uh, but uh, he's a Canadian artist. And uh, this, uh, uh, these are two pieces that I have chosen. And uh, the main one that I want to focus on is the Kentucky Perfect. So that's the, the perfect uh, lawnmower that constantly just uh, keeps the lawn uh, perfect. And uh, it's kind of important that he's Canadian because uh, these are perfect uh, flat lawns that is uh, uh, kind of uh, the new root of evil uh, because uh, we are spending so much energy on keeping them perfect so uh, that includes watering and also uh, mowing, uh, mowing the lawn because, uh, well, it's a bit of an, again, odd statistics, but uh, you could, uh, an hour of using an, a, a benzene-powered lawnmower could, uh, is the same amount of benzene that you would use in a car to drive 100 kilometers. Depends on a car, depends on the lawnmower, and so on. But that's uh, kind of the, the description of it. And uh, I like this, uh, the perfect lawn, because in Latvia we also keep them. And uh, for me, it makes absolutely no sense to keep uh, this, uh, this uh, plant that needs so much care, as opposed to uh, keeping a local plant that is uh, accustomed to the environment that, uh, it, that is. Uh, but uh, in a city, you see people hired in uh, yellow vests uh, walking around parks, weeding out plants that would grow there naturally to plant uh, this uh, lawn, perfect green grass, and uh, to, to make this uh, perfect uh, image. And uh, again, uh, this uh, would, uh, I wouldn't call it a deep sustainability artwork. And, uh, this is what I call my deep sustainability artwork. And uh, I'm spending my art practice uh, developing uh, different hydroponics and aquaponics systems. Uh, for me, the difference between hydroponics and aquaponics is almost none. It depends on the amount of uh, space a person has. And I'm developing them vertically, so we can put them in our windows or uh, like against the wall, so uh, as, as opposed to just uh, uh, taking up space. And if, uh, if a person has enough space to keep fish, they can keep fish. If not, they can have a little shoe box. And uh, in these shoe boxes, I'm growing all of the basil that I need for my life. I'm also growing uh, teas. Uh, sometimes tomatoes, uh, sometimes strawberries, really depends uh, on the season and on my interest at the moment. Uh, and uh, I have reduced aquaponics, hydroponics to kind of this uh, minimum effort bucket, holes, plants and uh, air supply. And if, it's an, uh, if there are fish involved, there's also a filter and a pump. But uh, this is uh, what I call my deep sustainability. So it's a, it's a sustainable artwork that in my eyes can also 
reconnect us to nature and also we can grow a tiny little bit of our food because I do believe that uh, everyone is able to keep a shoebox of food and in that way we can reduce the amount of uh, Spanish tomatoes that we are buying in a supermarket. And if everyone can just reduce a tiny bit of uh, the food that uh, we are importing, that would already be a, a huge uh, relief for, for the planet. That is uh, my presentation. <laughs> up some questions, the answers you would like to hear later in the discussion part. So we kind of don't ask at the moment your questions to you, but other way around. Well, uh, I'm interested in, um, in this. Uh, people say that uh, uh, they, uh, the plants that they are trying to grow, they, they, they are not growing, they are not interested in growing, and uh, they don't have the, the space for growing. And I would really like to hear what kind of uh, what kind of parts of your life you would be interested to give up for the benefit of uh, the planet, because uh, it is uh, clear that uh, and we we all know that recycling is good, but what is even better is not buying the stuff in the first place. So I would really like you to uh, think about what are the kind of the, the luxuries of the common person's everyday life that you would, uh, you could just say, I will, I will stop uh, washing my hair and, and air blowing them every day. Or uh, I don't know what else is uh, very, very common. <laughs> Not doing a laundry every day. Or just think about uh, the little things that uh, you could give up. Okay, we will discuss then this in the discussion part. So, because um, you you can navigate us through maybe some of these questions because um, there are maybe not so many things which are which which we would like to give up. So maybe there are some which we are okay. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you can help us identify. Okay, thank you. Mike. Wait, you <coughs> comment something that uh, that this part of the grass quickly there's a moment to say that I, there, I read in like, a book of Timothy Morton. The, the story of this loan uh, was, in a way, in, in the English gardens to hide or distract the sight, you know, the, the eye vision. Oh, it's that's the that's yeah, the, it's uh, the the lawn the tradition comes from. Uh, you put uh, your beautiful garden, your beautiful lawn, in front of the house, and that is uh, your presentable garden. And uh, this is the garden that hides the behind the house garden where you grow food and where the slaves work. Exactly. And slaves are not allowed on this beautiful grass. So these are the, the two gardens that we used to keep. And uh, that's, the, that's the tradition of the lawn. It's a symbol of the clean white people. Okay, great. But about the gardens, we really also can discuss some interesting practices. So how they are changing at the moment. So people who think about sustainability and sustainable growing. So they have some ideas. So, okay, that's a great question for discussion. Thank you. Okay.